Well, I want to thank everyone for being here today and for those of you that are tuning into our webcast. Uh, my name is Mark Hyden, and I'm the National Advocacy Coordinator for Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty. We are a national network of conservatives who believe that the death penalty is a violation of our time-worn principles of valuing life, fiscal responsibility, and limited government. Today, though, we're gathered here to discuss the release of our new report, which further demonstrates the growing conservative opposition to capital punishment. And we'll hear from several state legislators uh, today who have been a part of this change and of the recent surge of Republicans sponsoring death penalty repeal bills. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Washington State Senator Mark Melosha. Mark. Mark. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor to be here today. I very much appreciate to be uh, with a with an a ever-growing larger group of Republicans and conservatives here to say that we need to rethink what we're doing about the death penalty. As mentioned, I'm Mark Melosha from Federal Way. For those of you who don't know, that's right between Seattle and Tacoma. And I've been a consistent supporter of repealing or eliminating the death penalty. Why? Uh, for me, it's a pro-life issue. It's a Christian issue. It's a Catholic issue. Can we be pro-life and be supporting the death penalty? Um, I, I am well aware of the growing chorus of voices on the right side of the political spectrum uh, with Christian groups, not just Catholic evangelicals, saying maybe there's a better way to support life from conception to natural death. Is it the way we have to treat our, the least of our brothers and sisters? So for me, it's a very personal and a faith issue to be on this journey here to make sure all our citizens are protected, and we work for redemption. Pope Francis has been a very vocal, Pope Francis has been a very vocal critic of, 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 of our culture of death, that we should work for mercy and redemption. I think our criminal justice system, the way we treat our citizens, should also focus on those values. So for me, I'm glad to be part of this ever-growing group. I'm proud to be part of the effort in Washington State. I honestly believe we're only one or two votes away from making Washington State eliminate the death penalty with a large vote, bipartisan vote, of liberals and conservatives. Thank you all. Hello, everyone. I'm Adam Rosendale. I'm a House representative from Billings, Montana. And I'm here today um, also with this group just showing you, I mean, across the country where all groups are uh, starting to come together for repealing uh, death penalty. One of the biggest reasons I, uh, apart from what Mark had just said, being Catholic, it's one reason I support uh, getting rid of the death penalty, but limited government. We expect things out of our government. And uh, you know, we pay taxes in return, we get streets and stuff. But with the death penalty, there's not really a return. Putting criminals in prison you know, offers us safety, but then that next step of actual taking their lives, there's, I mean, there's nothing to gain from that other than a corpse. And so apart from many other reasons, that's one of the bigger drives why limited government um, what we expect out of our government, and that's just not one of them. Uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is uh, Colby, tall guy. <laughs> My name's Colby Coash, and uh, I served in the Nebraska State Legislature for eight years, uh, during which time uh, the legislature did uh, abolish the death penalty, and I was, I was part of that effort, uh, but I wasn't alone. I had uh, a whole group of Republicans who stood with me and said that uh, the death penalty is something that we in Nebraska at the time um, didn't, didn't comport well with our conservative values. And that was how we approached this. We, we looked at what we said to our constituents and voters about who we were as conservative lawmakers and how, that ide th how those ideals matched up against this idea of, of the death penalty. And we said things like, you know, we're, we're the party that is supposed to be putting the brakes on a growing government. We're supposed to be the check on a, a government, whether it's local, state, or federal, 
uh, that is getting too big for itself. And we're supposed to be the ones that, that are a check on that. And we're supposed to be the ones that have a healthy distrust for the power of government and a distrust or a cautious approach to uh, a growing and powerful government. And when we looked at the reality of the death penalty, where to date we have 157 people who are walking around on our streets today that used to be on death row, that told us that this is a system that is broken and we shouldn't trust this system when we've got the evidence to show us that it doesn't work. That idea of innocence and the, and the chance that the government would get it wrong, because we know they get it wrong. And 157 people almost lost their lives because government almost got it wrong. We looked at this idea of government efficiency. And aren't we supposed to be the side of the spectrum that says government should be as efficient as possible? We should do things as efficiently as we can. And in our state, the last execution was 20 years ago. And I often say that if any other government program were as inefficient as our death penalty program has been in Nebraska, we would have gotten rid of it a long time ago. But instead, 20 years and counting, and we, and we still uh, haven't got any return on that investment of that institution. So in closing, I guess what I would say is, you know, supporting the abolition of the death penalty, as, as my colleagues have, have said, isn't in spite of being a conservative at all. It's actually because we are conservative that we can stand here today and say, this is a program that isn't working for us. It doesn't work for, uh, for our, our budgets. and doesn't work for our idea of justice. And so uh, we don't have, we're, we're not hiding from that. And that's part of what this is about. We're, we're saying that we're using these principles uh, in a way that comports with our ideas about what, how government should be. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Hello, I'm Steve Urquhart. I was a Republican member of the Utah legislature from 2001 to 2016 eight years in the House, eight years in the Senate. Um, I want to talk about fiscal responsibility. Utah is widely recognized as the best or one of the best managed states in the nation from a fiscal perspective. Government needs to be accountable for the money it spends. Um, fiscal responsibility calls for repeal of the death penalty. Money spent on the death penalty is foolish producing the exact opposite of what is intended. Compared to life imprisonment, money spent on the death penalty turns murderers into celebrities. It denies closure to family victims, and it mocks basic deterrence concepts of our criminal laws. Life imprisonment saves taxpayers money, provides swift in final justice and condemns murderers to ignominious demise outside the public's gaze and attention. These simple irrefutable facts quickly turned my Republican Senate colleagues from staunch supporters of the death penalty to backers of repeal. It's the most amazing thing I saw in my 16 years in the Utah legislature. Never have I seen people's opinions change as quickly as when I would lay out these facts. I'd go to them, I'd say, you're in favor of the death penalty, right? They would say, right. Okay, give me three minutes. And so I'd lay out those facts, and at the end of those three minutes, they'd say, dang, I have to think about this. And then a majority of them voted to repeal the death penalty. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Heather Bodwin, and I'm one of the coordinators for conservatives concerned about the death penalty. After working for the Michigan Republican Senate Majority Leader and an internship at the Republican National Committee, I found myself living in Montana and working on the issue that I've always been most passionate about, which is ending the death penalty. 
In 2010, I had the privilege of helping to start the first conservatives concerned about the death penalty group um, alongside current and former Republican legislators, uh, conservative lobbyists, and GOP state party officials. We wanted to create a space where we could talk about the reasons that we as conservatives were concerned about the death penalty, and at that time, um, no space like that existed. We began meeting regularly and connecting with Republicans all over the state. We spoke at pachyderm clubs, we tabled at GOP state party conventions, and we traveled the state sharing RNEs with our state's death penalty. Um, we gained numerous supporters along the way, and hearts and minds were really changing. So we were very excited and encouraged, though we never dreamed that we would be standing here, that there would be so many other state groups and an incredibly robust national network of conservative leaders who are speaking out against the death penalty. I couldn't be more proud to stand here today to proclaim with certainty that the tide is turning and we're living in a new day. Republican legislators all over our country are leading death penalty repeal efforts and conservative leaders are standing up to fight against the system that is broken beyond repair. Among those speaking out are evangelical leaders um, who believe in redemption and the immense value of each and every human life. And as an evangelical myself, it gives me great hope to see some of our country's most prominent leaders who are calling for an end to the death penalty. The board of the National Latino Evangelical Coalition unanimously voted to pass an anti-death penalty resolution, and the National Association of Evangelicals recently dropped their 40-year-old pro-death penalty position, and those are just a couple of the examples of the shift that we're witnessing. I'm confident that this momentum against the death penalty will continue, and I'm truly honored to work toward a day when this field program is gone for good. Thank you. Before conservatives concerned about the death penalty launched in 2013, there was this pervasive myth that all conservatives wholeheartedly supported the death penalty. But we knew that this notion was pure fiction, and we aimed to expose this mistruth. Since our founding, I believe we've done this, and we've joined with the conservative grassroots, as well as national leaders, including Jay Sekulow, Richard Vigory, and Dr. Ron Paul, who all believe that the death penalty ought to be repealed. But today, Today we're here to discuss the release of our new report, which further demonstrates the growing conservative opposition to capital punishment. It details how it was once a rarity for Republicans to sponsor death penalty repeal bills, but things have greatly changed since then. In fact, in the year 2000, there were only four such sponsors, and for the next 12 years, that number never rose above single digits. Yet by 2013, the year that we launched, that number surged to 20. And last year, it peaked at 40 Republican death penalty repeal sponsors. The Republican momentum to end capital punishment is real. And it's clearly, it's clearly gaining steam. And I believe this increased conservative opposition signals that the death penalty's days are, in fact, numbered. But there's other evidence that also illustrates this point. An increasing number of Republican and evangelical institutions are abandoning their death penalty support. As a network, we've since founded around 11 state-based conservatives concerned about the death penalty groups. Death sentences, executions, and support for the death penalty are all either at or near historic lows. Now, these are not the only metrics by which we can identify the death penalty's slow demise. But it is interesting to note that much of capital punishment's recent decline has actually coincided with the rising conservative opposition to it. And given the steadfast leadership of the repeal sponsors here today and of the growing conservative momentum to end capital punishment, I believe its days are numbered. And with that, I thank you so much for, for being here. For those of you that tuned into our webcast, and if there are any questions, uh, we'd be happy to field them at this point. Uh, Joseph Moore, Omaha World Herald. I understand looking at the numbers that going from single digits to 30 or 40 is a surge. Another way to look at this is the total number of sponsors is less than half what it was just a few years ago. And the number of Republican sponsors still represents, I think, something like 1% of state Republican lawmakers in the country. So how, how much further do you really have to go before, as you say, you know, the, the days of this are numbered? 
Well, I think we've already made great strides. Um, we're seeing a lot of conservative states move uh, closer to repealing the death penalty. I mean, there's a few um, um, sponsors that have been highlighted in the report that we released. And you can look at um, Senator Clater in Louisiana. They nearly uh, worked to repeal the death penalty there. And I think they had a very good chance, uh, but there he came up a little bit short in the House. And you can see what Senator Urquhart did in Utah. He passed through the Senate. And I believe they would, if they had time and the session hadn't run out, they would have gotten it through the House. And you can say the same about a lot of these other states. I think we're on the cusp of it. Um, I can't predict the future. I can't read the tea leaves, but I think we're almost there. Please. I just give Washington State, for example, we have two Republicans. I'm the prime sponsor of the bill, the death penalty, in the Washington State Senate. But I can tell you right now, probably an informal vote count, at least a quarter of them would vote to repeal it. That's the hidden, the silent people who will vote for it. But if it looks like if we get it to a vote, that's when you start seeing the real open support from the people who will finally come out and say, hey, this is no big deal for conservatives and Republicans to repeal this. But the sponsors is the indicator you know, the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, that, that there is movement on this. Kate Irby with McClatchy. Uh, you said you have 40 in 2016 who sponsored bills like this. How many of them actually passed at least a single uh, chamber of the legislature? 2016. Do you have a number on that, Heather? I mean, it's been, uh, so each year has, um, has, has been uh, different in the amount that has passed out of committee. Some of these were the first time that they had actually introduced a bill. If, like in Kentucky with Dave Floyd's bill, when he introduced it, it was the first time it had been ever given a hearing um, since the early 70s. So this is early movement in a lot of these states, whereas others have gotten hearings and have passed out of one chamber. Uh, I can't give you an exact number, but if you'd like me to get back with you on that, I could give you a number in a pretty short period of time. Hey, uh, Thomas Burr with the Salt Lake Tribune. So this is all state-by-state state effort. Is, does that mean you're not going to ever try for any national effort to get this done through Congress to instead of doing a piecemeal state-by-state? State? Well, I think you can affect the most change at the state level. Uh, if, um, you know, we, we've always been focused on the state level. That's where most of the executions happen, and I believe that there's the greatest opportunity for change at that level. Um, especially if you look at where the executions are happening. I mean, in Texas, had over 500 executions, whereas the federal government, the federal death penalty, they've executed uh, three people in the modern era. So I think, one, it's a, we can affect more change if we do it at the state level, and I think we have a, uh, better prospects of getting it done, just because when you look at D.C., bipartisanship right now seems a little taboo, and it's kind of hard to get much passed. Uh, so I think the prospects are a little bit better in the states. Kate Irby McClatchy again. Do you guys have an explanation for that drop in 2017 from 2016? Sure. Uh, not every legislature uh, is in session every single uh, year. So some of them are every two years, and that's why. Do you think that explains it alone? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, if there are no other questions, um, we'll be um, here for a few minutes if you want to come up and talk to us individually. And, um, you know, I really appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate the opportunity, and I hope you have a wonderful day.